Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around the world on ThinkTech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii and Moana Nui Akea. I'm your host, Joshua Cooper, and today we're looking at the children's rights movement in the Mekong Delta and indigenous youth demanding dignity through the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. The UN Convention on the Rights of the Child serves as the most important international human rights instrument and most widely ratified in the world. It's an honor for me to be able to share the stage today with three activists, advocates that are here at the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child taking place in Geneva, Switzerland. I'd like to first talk with our amazing youth at 16 years of age. So Conte, can you share with us what is the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and why is it so important to you and to the Khmer Krom people living in the Mekong Delta? Thank you for the question. Um, so the Convention on the Rights of the Child was, is basically an opportunity for other countries or NGOs to um, send in um, uh, quest, not questions, but like what issues they're facing in their, in their homeland. And the countries get to review those questions and follow up with statements. And they also get given um, recommendations for them to work on later on. Um, as the Khmer youth, I'm 16 years old. And um, this really relates to me because uh, this can affect my people and to imagine kids around my age to be affected by this, it really hits home. And as a connected on youth, uh, we struggle with a lot of self-identity and being able to identify ourselves as indigenous people. So coming to this convention for my first time in Geneva, um, this really does mean a lot to me because being able to relate to the people and these issues that these children are facing around the world um, really does hit home. Putini, what does the CRC mean to you? And what's it like being here in Geneva participating as it's going on? The 18 experts are reviewing the countries and maybe share a bit on why you're here and what you're able to contribute. Uh, the reason why I'm here first and why I'm contributing it is because um, I've been doing some research on the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And um, I found out that the Vietnamese law on Article 1 is just not, um, it's just not right because they are defining child. Um, every human being under 16 years old. And the Article 1 of CRC is defining every human being under 18. So that was the first, um, the first, let's say, the, not mistake, but the first thing when I thought, hmm, this is weird. And then I did some more researches and I felt really big injustice towards the kids who are there in the Khmer Krom Mekong Delta, but also in the whole country of Vietnam. Um, that's why I'm here to learn more about the Convention on the Rights, on the review on it, and how the experts were thinking about this one article. And also on the other aspects like Buddhism, our uh, religion and educational system there in the Mekong Delta. And um, I'm sorry, what was, all, uh, what was the question again? So I've answered the contribution and also why I'm here, right? Yep, thank you so much for your participation. Moni, moving on to Moni. Moni, what's it like to be here at the Committee on the Rights of the Child and why do you think it's so important to participate and bring the voice of the Khmer Krom here to the grounds in Geneva? So thank you um, for give, giving us this opportunity. As um, I'm represent for the Kekam Chikam Federation to uh, at this review, um, as you know that the people in the Mekong Delta, uh, they don't have an opportunity to come to Geneva uh, to attend review or raise the issue to the United Nations. So as an organization abroad, we uh, advocate for the right of the people, especially the, um, the, the Kekam children. So this, this is the second time that uh, our organization participate in the review. And this is crucial for us to come here because um, our, our organization actually submitted the report 
But uh, in order to uh, make it effective, we have to come here to meet the uh, community member to uh, present the issue in a way that the community member can have uh, bring the issue um, talk to uh, during the review, uh, talk uh, to the uh, going to be that with delegation. So um, uh, the the important of the, the review is to let the you yeah, the committee member know you know the issue that our people are facing, especially in uh, uh, many areas that the the Mekong children are facing in the Mekong Delta. Thank you, Moni, and appreciate you sharing that perspective. We know the Convention on the Rights of the Child is the most widely ratified that every country in the world, except for the United States, has ratified, and that it creates a committee of eighteen experts to engage and review the rights in the best interest of the child. And children and youth participate in the UNCRC process to, to secure the full spectrum of human rights from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Could you share with us what it's like being here? Because what was so significant is this Committee on the Rights of the Child, all 18 experts actually review countries that have ratified the instrument and then engage with them. Can you maybe share a bit with how your work began here on Monday, meeting with the CRC task force and the rapporteur, and then be some of the highlights where you've been able to see Sunkotia, the results of the important advocacy work that the Khmer Krom youth, as well as the Khmer Krom board of directors have been able to bring forward by sharing the voice of the Khmer indigenous children from the Mekong Delta here in Geneva. Initially, when I came into uh, coming to the Convention of the Rights of, uh, of the Children, um, growing up, my father had always told me about this here and there, about like uh, how the government works and like essentially this um, convention in general. But I was able to like face this firsthand through this um, week. On Monday, we were able to talk with the special rapporteur and um, speak to him about our current issues. And then later on, during uh, the session with uh, the, the experts and the Vietnamese uh, government, uh, while as they address their um, their progress, it was very interesting to see how they would like respond to certain questions or remarks, and to see um, the experts specifically nailing down different topics and then pushing forward, like asking for like specific data or like numbers or like anything. It really shows like how like specific and how um how much they want to make a difference and see like our improvement like as uh vietnam's improvement as a country to hopefully reach these uh better rights and from monday to tuesday tuesday uh we were able to get a follow-up for the questions from the previous day and it was a lot more interesting to sit today to see how um how they respond to the questions because sometimes they were like a bit vague or sometimes they were like off topic, but overall, it was um, it was like a very phenomenal experience. And it's really, as you describe it, it's, it seems like a lot. Uh, on Monday morning, it was a meeting with the Committee on the Rights of the Child Task Force, as well as the rapporteur, being able to meet with that expert from Bhutan, and also be able to have a breakfast briefing with them directly to share. And then as you talked about, Yesterday on Monday after the breakfast briefing, they actually take those questions and recommendations, the three that they asked about. And then you could see some of the research that you had done actually coming into action when the experts take your information you've shared and then directly question the government. And Putini, maybe you can share some of the research you brought up around Article One and other aspects that really stood out to you about this review of Vietnam at the Committee on the Rights of the Child, either in the three hour section yesterday from three to six, or this morning looking at the 10 o'clock to one o'clock session. In these six hours of review, what stood out to you about how the CRC committee can have an impact? Um, the thing that stood out for me during my research on the articles on their law, was first thing the article one because like I said before, they are def defining 
um, they are defining uh, children being um, underneath 16, being a child. But so six, uh, between 16 and 18, they are defined as adults, adolescents. So they don't have the same rights they will have as the other kids. And I feel like that's not fair at all um, in terms of the education and health. Because during the session, they gave answers on the health questions, um, saying they are providing health packages for every age. So under six and under seven and between eight and ten. And so they're being fake about the age. They did not give us a clear explanation why they are defining children um, under 16 and not under 18 as the article one of CRC is given. So, and also they're just defining ages as if it's just our number, just numbers. Like, I mean, ages are just numbers, but it's really important to protect the children uh, from illness viruses uh, viruses and other more diseases but at this moment they're being really fake about it and also about the violence against children they are also being fake about it because um, also in terms of that they are just separating every age every age um, cap and category um, and they have there were questions about Khmer Krau as an indigenous people and why they were not called as indigenous people. The Vietnamese delegations, they were answer, they answered the question with Khmer Krau are not being discriminated and they are ethnic minorities. So the thing about that is they were not mentioning us as indigenous people. They are still seeing us as um, ethnic major, majority. Um, and the thing we want to, to hear is that we are indigenous people and we have the freedom to express ourselves like we will do um, in terms of speaking our own Khmer language and um, practicing Buddhism to traditional ways. But they did not um, say that we are for them we are just ethnic minorities. Those things were really standing out for me. Thank you so much, Putini. Moving back to Moni. Moni, what were the main issues that the Committee on the Rights of the Child raised to the Vietnam government delegation? And why are those issues so important to Khmer Krom children? Thank you. Um, so, um, so the some important issue that uh, we brought it up uh, during the uh, private meeting with uh, committee member, and the issue we mentioned were, were being asked at uh, during the review. So the first one is like uh, the, the cell uh, and then identify as a clinic ground, and we um, and we saw that uh, the committee member it asking about you know. Um, is the people they should have the right to identify who they are or not and then uh, secondly about the my migration like the migration meaning like uh, the, the connect around children uh, can be named as what they want to be or not or they can be called the village in the the, the, the way uh, uh, they want to be or um, especially about religious uh, freedom as well like uh, the connect around children, uh, do they need ask for, uh, for permission to be ordained as a Buddhist monk or not? So this important issue to uh, to be mentioned and the uh, committee member actually um, ask in a way, even though sometimes they don't ask directly, but the question will phrase in a way to ask the government how to respond to it. And um, just like um, and the question about uh, our identity, uh, they always say that they do not discriminate it and uh, you know even the dude say they do not discriminate but to prove it uh, they just answer in a way very way so kanti and putini maybe you can share one of the highlights today i think the court justice from samoa Bui nelson actually posed a question regarding indigeneity 
and maybe some of the other aspects that I think that are important that were raised around birth certificate and bilingualism to make sure that the Khmer language could flourish and that people could name their children based on their own language and cosmology and belief system. Could you maybe describe both of those aspects, Sokanti? Um, so regarding um, uh, the uh, Samoan um, expert, he specifically asked about the Quebec people and the injustices we faced as um, we're not able to fully identify ourselves as Indigenous and um, have the right to uh, religion. Basically, uh, because he specifically called out our group of people, the Vietnamese government uh, had was uh, shown spotlight internationally and was forced to um, speak out about this. Uh, like usual, they de declined that we, we face discrimination and that we're an uh, ethnic minority. But, uh, but it's the fact that they did call us connect at home shows that there, uh, there is some improvement, which not, is not a lot but there is still some progress. And um, I'll let me talk about the certificates. Yes, so um, he was doing a great job asking that question because that way the Vietnamese delegates, they were um, pushing in a corner where they need to answer that question without being um, without discriminating the micro indigenous people, because it ironically they said we are ethnic minority. That way they were indirectly saying we are just one of the other ethnic minority groups, but we are just indigenous people. Like we live there way longer than they are. It's um, our language, our cultures, and that. They are just taking away every year more and more and more. And I'm going to quote this. Um, they are saying, we would like to reaffirm that Vietnam does not have any kind of discrimination against ethnic minorities. So um, what they are saying is they can keep their language and their writings, but what we hear from the locals inside the country is that they are getting controlled by the government, asking what their school curriculum is. Like school needs to show them what kind of books they are showing it to their students. And also the students there, the Khmer Crown, are um, learning Khmer for just two or three hours a week, which is really limited. It's really not that much especially when you have the roots of Khmer, you just want to communicate with other Khmer people, but this way they cannot maintain the Khmer language. And also the Buddhism, the um, boys, if they want to be monk, they need to ask permission to be monks. That's just, it's not right at all. I mean, it's weird to get permission of the government if you want to practice your um, religion and lifestyle, but that money, Mao can explain way more. He knows a lot about this issue, way more. Thank you so much. And it allows us to look at the issue of the Vietnamization of the Khmer indigenous culture, really from birth, naming, all the way until the end of life throughout that entire process. But also, Moni, maybe you can share about the decolonization and how indigenous peoples are naming their children still with indigenous names and also combating this racism and discrimination. Yes, um, you know, uh, for us in our culture, like it's really important for us to, you know, have a, our own name. And in our culture, sometimes um, the, the parents bring the children to the temple and the Buddhist monk will name them. And that's a name that we, we all proud of, right? Uh, because uh, was it the name by the parent or the name by the, the head monk of the, in our local community? But when you go to, uh, when the parent go to uh, register for birth, uh, birth certificate, you know, the, when they came into the, uh, the, the, the local office, they asked the parent, say, you know, the name is really hard to write, or, you know, you had to uh, write in a way that, you know, the Vietnamese people can pronounce or you change your Chai name to the Vietnamese name. So if uh, you live in a society 
that uh, you don't even have a right to give uh, the name to your children and the children grow up they they don't even know that you know when they look at their name oh my name is a really mean name and um uh, and then uh, they they may get confused or maybe they feel humiliating because uh, you know um, they don't have their own identity right so that's why when we brought up this issue with uh, the community member and they say this is a victimization because um, you cannot force the people to change the name or you know write a name in the way uh, you you want to, uh, to be not not the, the original name that uh, the parent want or the, the child to be proud when they grow up. So um, yeah, this is one angle of uh, victimization, right? And then secondly, like we we, we talk about uh, the language we learn, and then uh, the, if your children learn the language, and then when they cannot view in the public uh, uh, document or or like you know the TV channel, they just uh, pay one one hour per week or all the pro the program that. Uh, they broadcast in you know not not in Vietnamese or don't have much in the in the Khmer language for the children to to master or you know to learn about more about their culture. Then eventually you lose the language, then your culture will be die out too, right? So that um, that is the major major concern, and that's why we, we we brought this up and we say we should start from the children. If the children lose the language, the children don't know who they are, then you know that 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 is a genocide. Thank you, Moni. And that's so important because really as the world commemorates the 15th anniversary of the adoption of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, it's exciting to see Indigenous children create campaigns for the realization of Indigenous children's rights. And especially in the Mekong Delta, the government said during the CRC that the CRC is widely distributed. But of course, today inside Kram, the students were wearing the same t-shirts maybe you're wearing and they were commemorating the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. But what happened when they organized inside the Mekong Delta just simply to address and commemorate the adoption of this important declaration? Sukunti, what was going on there? So essentially what happened was we organized with the youth in Kampuche uh, Krom for us to wear these uh, t-shirts to form in solidarity of the uh, celebration for the 15th anniversary. And unfortunately, the Vietnamese government did come to their celebration, but at the celebration itself, no one was uh, arrested, it's detained. They were just uh, there. But as soon as we were leaving, there, uh, there were some individuals that were harassed with the police and they were, the police gave them um, excuses saying like, oh, your motorcycle mirror is broken or like damaged and claiming that that was the reason they pulled him over. But in reality, they had their phones out recording him, showing that it wouldn't, they wouldn't record someone just because of their motorcycle mirror, mirror being broken. There's, there's another story to it, which uh, even though as bad as that sounds, that is progress because uh, previously there were some people that were detained, showing that this now, instead of being detained, they were questioned, which is still bad, but it shows that there's still some progress and it's showing that the government is actually realizing the uh, efforts of our people and trying of uh, realizing slowly that oh um we should actually adopt the the declaration of the rights of indigenous people and recognize it with our people that's a great point and it reminds me also of the international women's day on march 8th women wearing t-shirts but then having huge situation as well as even sustainable development goals where people who just we're distributing the global goals, 17 global goals, were harassed and even arrested. Putini, what does this mean that the youth though are so brave, even though they know what could happen to them, that they'll do anything to use their human rights, to be able to improve human rights for the rest of their community and see that ripple across the Mekong Delta? Um, for me personally, it means a lot because they are there inside the country, which is, more dangerous to stand up for their rights because the cops can arrest them and arrest and harass them anytime um and even get like um get them in jail because they're fighting for their rights uh i am outside of the country and i don't know if i was in the country i didn't i i don't think i will um, have the courage and the, and 
strength to stand and fight up for our rights because it's really dangerous and it, it can be scary. Uh, so it means a lot for me to do this, to advocate for them too and like support each other so we can one day be all free and just be ourselves without being scared. It is an amazing act of compassion, creativity, and courage to organize at the UN Convention, the Committee on the Rights of the Child in Geneva, but simultaneously on the ground with people in both places wearing shirts with the same message. Moni, what was that like to create such a campaign and what are we doing going forward? So, I think this is a crucial for, for us is a, at this moment because it's a, a clear message to our people back home or people around the world that you know when you stand up for your right, even though a, 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 a member state like Vietnam is like you know uh, carry on the, the the policy of oppressing people, but they have to step back to think twice, right? Because the people just ask for the basic right and the, the authority try to stop them, and this will uh, give uh, the the people who stand for the, up for their right, um, you know, uh, more thinking about bravely to uh, to continue working on uh, their, their their demanding. For their, their basic right. So this is the, the the first step for our people back home to realize their right and demanding for it because they de they should deserve it because this, those rights are inside in the international uh, treaty that uh, uh, Vietnam signed with the uh, ratified with the, the UN. Thank you all three of you for your amazing advocacy this week uh, to participate at the UN committee on the rights of the child as well as commemorating the 15th anniversary of the UN declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples and another tv show we can focus also on the committee on the rights of persons with disability where today we shared with them that indigeneity is not a disability it's actually a strength and more diversity inside vietnam recognizing the indigenous host culture can actually create a culture of a better world rooted in human rights. So thank you all three for the work that you're doing here at the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. And we hope that the recommendations that are issued, we can see some improvements by the time of International Day of Children's Rights on November 20th. Mahalo and thank you all for joining. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.